Uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome to a little bit of reading time. See there's a couple of you people here which is a couple more than I might have guessed would show up to something like this. Uh, but I appreciate that. Uh, you know a lot of you follow me on Twitter or tune into these live streams or looking for map related content and you know you got my website there if you want to go look at map related things but uh, I thought this would be a good time to do something do something a little different. Uh, something away from sort of what we normally deal with in our lives and maybe to relax just a little bit by uh, by reading about birds. I like reading aloud to people and I uh, this is the selections I'm going to read come from a book that I like to read uh, selections from to people and I've been told that me reading to people sometimes relaxes them so hopefully you'll uh, derive a little benefit from this and you can kind of keep this on it's basically like a, what we're doing basically as a live podcast I would say uh, before we begin just a little background about what I'm going to be reading from uh, this is um, John James Audubon and he was a naturalist and a painter active in the United States in the first half of the 20th of the 19th century and he made it his mission to paint all the birds in America. And he eventually published them in a book called The Birds of America, uh, with, as this says here, 435 life-size watercolors. Uh, and he spent a lot of time in the United Kingdom raising money to print this very expensive book. And one of the interesting things about it is that it's actually two books. The Birds of America is a giant book full of paintings, and you know you can kind of see um, the edge of some pages here. You, you can see the book here uh, on the top of this uh, page provided by Audubon.org, which is a society uh, for bird conservation that's named after him, although it came up um, quite some time after he died, so he didn't really have any involvement in it. Uh, they published this book, but due to a law in the United Kingdom, if you published a book with words in it, you had to offer free copies to every library in the country. And so they couldn't afford that. But he wanted to include descriptions of all these birds, so he published a separate book. So he published the very expensive fancy book of paintings that he had done of all these birds. And then he separately published a book called Ornithological Biographies, in which he describes all the birds that you would be looking at if you had his book of paintings. And they could afford to print that and send it around to all the libraries. So just kind of a, a fun fact of how this comes about. Uh, all of the, the uh, images from the book and the text are available at audubon.org. And that's pretty much what I'm going to be pulling from here. And uh, yeah, I guess that's my that's my preamble. So I'm going to start off with the entry that I first read from this book. Uh, a friend of mine I was visiting with a couple of friends of mine, and one of them said to me that I might find this interesting and charming, and in fact I did, uh, and that is the Blue Jay. And so if you see here, they've got little clips from all of his paintings, and if I scroll down, eventually we find the Blue Jay. And They've got a clip from one of the paintings, and you can download the whole thing, and here's all the text. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to transition you over so you can appreciate the imagery a little bit better while I talk. Uh, I'm going to transition you over to a little slideshow uh, where I just quickly threw together, like five minutes ago, uh, a few clips uh, from the image as well as the overall thing. So let's dive in. Plate 102, Blue Jay. Reader... Look at the plate in which are represented three individuals of this beautiful species, rogues though they may be, and thieves as I would call them, were it fit for me to pass judgment on their actions. See how each is enjoying the fruits of his knavery, sucking the egg which he has pilfered from the nest of some innocent dove or harmless partridge. Who could imagine that a form so graceful, arrayed by nature in a garb so resplendent, should harbor so much mischief? that selfishness, duplicity, and malice should form the moral accompaniments of so much physical perfection. Yet so it is, and how like beings of a much higher order are these gay deceivers. I, I could write you a whole chapter on this subject, were my task not of a different nature. The blue jay is one of those birds that are found capable of subsisting in cold as well as in warm climates. 
It occurs as far north as the Canadas, where it makes occasional attacks upon the corn cribs of the farmers, and it is found in the most southern portions of the United States, where it abounds during the winter. Everywhere it manifests the same mischievous disposition. It imitates the cry of the sparrowhawk so perfectly that the little birds in the neighborhood hurry into the thick coverts to avoid what they believe to be the attack of that marauder. It robs every nest it can find, sucks the eggs like the crow, or tears to pieces and devours the young birds. A friend once wounded a grouse and marked the direction which it followed, but had not proceeded two hundred yards in pursuit when he heard something fluttering in the bushes, and found his bird belabored by two blue jays, who were picking out its eyes. The same person once put a flying squirrel into the cage of one of these birds, merely to preserve it for one night, but on looking into the cage about eleven o'clock next day, he found the animal partly eaten. A blue jay at Charleston destroyed all the birds of an aviary. One after another had been killed, and rats were supposed to have been the culprits, but no crevice could be seen large enough to admit one. Then the mice were accused, and war was waged against them, but still the birds continued to be killed, first the smaller, then the larger, until at length the Key West pigeons, when it was discovered that a jay which had been raised in the aviary was the depredator. He was taken out and placed in a cage with a quantity of corn, flour, and several small birds which he had just killed. The birds he soon devoured, but the flour he would not condescend to eat, and, refusing every other kind of food, soon died. In the north, it is fond of ripe chestnuts, and in visiting the trees it is sure it is sure to select the choicest. When these fail, it attacks the beech nuts, acorns, pears, apples, and green corn. While at Louisville, in Kentucky, in the winter of 1830, I purchased 25 of these birds, at the rate of 61 cents each, which I shipped to New Orleans, and afterwards to Liverpool, with the view of turning them out into the English woods. They were caught in common traps, baited with maize, and were brought to me one after another as soon as secured. In placing them in the large cage which I had ordered for the purpose of sending them abroad, I was surprised to see how cowardly each newly caught bird was when introduced to his brethren, who, on being in the cage a day or two, were as gay and frolicsome as if at liberty in the woods. The newcomer, on the contrary, would run into a corner, place his head almost in a perpendicular position, and remain silent and sulky, with an appearance of stupidity quite foreign to his nature. He would suffer all the rest to walk over him, trample him down, without ever changing his position. If corn or fruit was presented to him, or even placed close to his bill, he would not so much as look at it. If touched with the hand, he would cower, lie down on his side, and remain motionless. The next day, however, things were altered. He was again a jay, taking up corn, placing it between his feet, hammering it with his bill, splitting the grain, picking out the kernel, and dropping the divided husks. When the cage was filled, it was amusing to listen to their hammering, all mounted on their perch side by side, each pecking at a grain of maize, like so many blacksmiths paid by the piece. They drank a great deal, ate broken pecan nuts, grapes, dried fruit of all sorts, and especially fresh beef, of which they were extremely fond, roosted very peaceably close together, and were very pleasing pets. Now and then one would utter a cry of alarm, when instantly all would leap and fly about as if greatly concerned, making as much ado as if their most inveterate enemy had been in the midst of them. They bore the, bas the passage to Europe pretty well, and most of them reached Liverpool in good health, but a few days after their arrival a disease occasioned by insects adhering to every part of their body made such progress that some died every day. Many remedies were tried in vain, and only one individual reached London. The insect had so multiplied on it that I immersed it in an infusion of tobacco, which, however, killed it in a few hours. On advancing north, I observed that as soon as the Canada jay made its appearance, the blue jay became more and more rare. Not an individual did any of our party observe in Newfoundland or Labrador during our stay there. On landing a few miles from Pictou, on the 22nd of August, 1833, after an absence of several months from the United States, the voice of a blue jay sounded melodious to me, and the sight of a hummingbird quite filled my heart with delight. These jays are plentiful in all parts of the United States. In Louisiana, they are so abundant as to prove a nuisance to the farmers, picking newly planted corn, 
the peas, the sweet potatoes, attacking every fruit tree, and even destroying the eggs of pigeons and domestic fowls. The planters are in the habit of occasionally soaking cor some corn in a solution of arsenic and scattering the seeds over the ground, in consequence of which many jays are found dead about the fields and gardens. The blue jay is extremely expert in discovering a fox, a raccoon, or any other quadruped hostile to birds, and will follow it, emitting a loud noise as if desirous of bringing every jay or crow to its assistance. It acts in the same manner towards owls, and even on some occasion towards hawks. This species breeds in all parts of the United States, from Louisiana to Maine, and from the upper Missouri to the coast of the Atlantic. In South Carolina, it seems to prefer for this purpose the live oak trees. In the lower parts of the Floridas, it gives place in great measure to the Florida jay. Nor did I meet with a single individual in the keys of that peninsula. In Louisiana, it breeds near the planter's house, and in the upper parts of the trees growing in the avenues, or even in yards, and generally at a greater height than in the middle states, where it is comparatively shy. It sometimes takes possession of the old or abandoned nest of a crow or cuckoo. In the southern states, from Louisiana to Maryland, it breeds twice every year, but to the eastward of the latter state seldom more than once. Although it occurs in all places from the seashore to the mountainous districts, it seems more abundant in the latter. The nest is composed of twigs and other coarse materials lined with fibrous roots. The eggs are four or five, of a dull olive color, spotted with brown. The blue jay is truly omnivorous, feeding indiscriminately on all sorts of flesh, seeds, and insects. He is more tyrannical than brave, and like most boasters, domineers over the feeble, dreads the strong, and flies even from his equals. In many cases, in fact, he is a downright coward. The cardinal grosbeak will challenge him and beat him off the ground. The red thrush, the mockingbird, and many others, although inferior in strength, never allow him to approach their nest with impunity. And the jay, to be even with them, creeps silently to it in their absence, and devours their eggs and young whenever he finds an opportunity. I have seen one go its round from one nest to another every day, and suck the newly laid eggs of the different birds in the neighborhood, with as much regularity and composure as a physician would call in his patients. I have also witnessed the sad disappointment it experienced when, on returning to its own home, it found, it mate, it found its mate in the jaws of a snake, the nest upset, and the eggs all gone. I have thought more than once on such occasions that, like all great culprits, when brought to a sense of their enormities, it evinced a strong feeling of remorse. While at Charleston in November 1833, Dr. Wilson of that city told me that on opening a, diver a division of his aviary, a mockingbird that he had kept for three years flew at another and killed it, after which it destroyed several blue jays, which he had been keeping for some months in an adjoining compartment. The blue jay seeks for its food with greatest diligence at all times, but more especially during the period of its migration. At such, whenever there are ch uh, chinquapins, wild chestnuts, acorns, or grapes, flocks will be seen to alight on the topmost branches of these trees, disperse, and engage with great vigor in detaching the fruit. Those that fall are picked up from the ground and carried into a chink in the bark, the splinters of a fence rail or firmly held underfoot on a branch, and hammered with the bill until the kernel be procured. As if for the purposes of gleaning the country in this manner, the blue jay migrates from one part to another during the day only. A person traveling or hunting by night may now and then disturb the repose of a jay, which in its terror sounds an alarm that is instantly responded to by all its surrounding traveling companions, and their multiplied cries make the woods resound far and near. While migrating, they seldom fly to any great distance at a time without alighting. For like true rangers, they ransack and minutely inspect every portion of the woods, the fields, the orchards, and even the gardens of the farmers and planters. Always exceedingly garrulous, they may easily be followed to any distance, and the more they are chased, the more noisy do they become, unless a hawk happen to pass suddenly near them, when they are instantly struck dumb, and as if ever conscious of deserving punishment, either remain motionless for a while, or silently sneak off into the closest thickets, where they remain concealed as long as their dangerous enemy is near. During the winter months, they collect in large numbers about the plantations of the southern states, approach the houses and barns, 
attend the feeding of the poultry, as well as of the cattle and horses, in their separate pens, in company with the cardinal grosbeak, the toho bunting, the cow bunting, the starlings, the starlings and grackles, pick up every grain of loose corn they can find, search amid the droppings of horses along the roads, and enter the corn cribs, where many are caught by the cat and the sons of the farmer. Their movements on the wing are exceedingly graceful. As they pass from one tree to another, their expanded wings and tail, exhibiting all the beauty of their graceful form and lovely tints, never fail to delight the observer. Although this species proceeds up the Missouri River to the eastern declivities of the Rocky Mountains, it is not found on the Columbia. Dr. Richardson says that it, quote, visits the fur countries in the summers, up to the 56th parallel, but seldom approaches the shores of Hudson's Bay, end quote. He is, however, mistaken when he says that it, quote, frequents the southern states only in winter, end quote, for it is found there at all seasons and breeds in every district of them, as well as in the, te as well as in the Texas where I found it, although it was rare. The eggs measure an inch and a half in length, and an inch and a half, and the ma yes, pardon me. The eggs measure an inch and half an eighth in length, and seven eighths in breadth. The end. All right, so you get a sense of Audubon's prose there. It's very, it's very personality driven, right? It's it's he assigns a lot of personalities to the birds and their movements and descriptions, which is really entertaining to read, and also it's very much about his own experiences and his friends. And you'll find as you go through this book, he is not uh, not shy about criticizing his fellow naturalists and ornithologists when he thinks they're wrong. Or I don't remember which ones I've read before that have had this, but he's talked about like, ah, I think that Dr. So-and-so has hardly ever seen one of these birds to describe them. So things like that. Uh, and I really also, as a side note, find it amusing that he just sort of discussed, oh, I bought 25 of them and I got a good price with a view of releasing them as an invasive species in England. Uh, which I guess maybe that was, you know, that's sort of the sort of thing that probably people were less concerned about in the 19th century. I guess they just thought, well, you know, maybe they could use some more blue jays there. But fairly amusing. All right, I do have a couple more lined up for today. But uh, I will also put the question to you, audience. Uh, I got this little slideshow going that I rapidly threw together, as I said, right before I started. And uh, it's you know, showing an image every 10 seconds. Uh, let me know if you want me to slow that down or speed that up, because I can easily go in and alter that parameter. In the meanwhile, I am going to pull up the next one on our list here. And also feel free to say hi in the chat. It's nice to have you here. I don't know if you're people who are interested in birds. I actually like, I, you know, I've read selections from the ornithological biographies, but I am not super knowledgeable about birds. Blue jays are probably one of the only birds that I could identify by sight because uh, they're quite distinctive. Uh, okay. All right, so the next one I've got up here. is the black pole warbler plate 133 no sooner had the ripley come to an anchor in the curious harbor of labrador known by the name of little macatina than my party and myself sought the shore oh hello I'm getting a hello in the chat here hello Gokul. when can we see your mapping tutorial again you know um i am thinking about um doing something within the next several weeks. And I'll, I'll mention this a little bit again at the end of today's uh, today's little spiel. Uh, I am planning on doing definitely another season of Live Cardo. Um, people are asking me to slow down the slideshow, so I'll do that while I talk here. It's 10 seconds now. Let's do like, let's do 20. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Okay. Uh, I'm planning on doing more live cartography stuff. This is just a little break from the usual, but I want to talk about, uh, next up, I think I want to talk about color. Uh, some of the ways I think about color and trying to like organize the way, I think breaking down color into its component dimensions and thinking about color systems can be really useful when approaching design to, to kind of 
uh, be more organized about it. I also definitely still want to do some things about raster cartography. And I'm thinking about you know doing a series on that where we sort of start from the beginning and we just say, what is a raster? How do we, you know, process rasters? How do we, you know, what how do we what are what is bit depth? What does resolution mean? Starting with really basic stuff. Pulling and then talking about working with raster data in GIS, and then eventually sort of all the bits and pieces you need to eventually make your way into a terrain map. Because I think there's not uh, you know, there are proportionally fewer resources I think that exist out there for raster things. So that's kind of what's coming up. Um, um, you know, it's not going to be birds all the time, definitely. Although I have considered, um, I have considered uh, doing a podcast in which I just read from this book. Uh, I actually recorded a couple episodes last year, but then the editing was just, you know, there was it took forever because reading an entry like that Blue Jay, I mean, I just went right through it. But imagine it taking five times longer because I wanted I wanted to clean up every little thing and carefully stitch together the better takes. So if I did a podcast, I'd actually probably, to make it easier, just read. And if I stumble over words, eh, that's fine. People can live with it. Maybe I'll come back to that idea at some point when I have more time. But yeah, there's definitely more stuff coming. And I appreciate you all being here, both for uh, bird reading and uh, for future cartography things. Uh, awesome. And hello to Lord Noodle and to Rick Letter Barnes for also being here. And, and I did did uh, change the slideshow to 20 seconds, so hopefully that's a little bit better. And if you want to want me to slow it down further, uh, just let me know. But let's uh, let's dive into the Blackpool Warbler. No sooner had the Ripley come to an anchor in the curious harbor of Labrador, known by the name of Little Macatina, than my party and myself sought the shore. But before I proceed, let me describe this singular place. It was the middle of July. The weather was mild and pleasant. Our vessel made her way under a smart breeze through a very narrow passage, beyond which we found ourselves in a small circular basin of water, having an extent of seven or eight acres. It was so surrounded by high, abrupt, and rugged rocks that, as I glanced around, I could find no apter comparison for our situation than that of a nutshell in the bottom of a basin. The dark shadows that overspread the waters and the mournful silence of the surrounding desert sombered our otherwise glad feelings into a state of awe. The scenery was grand and melancholy. On one side hung over our heads in stupendous masses a rock several hundred feet high, the fissures of which might to some have looked like the mouths of some huge, undefined monster. Here and there, a few dwarf pines were struck, were stuck as if by magic to this enormous mass of granite. In a gap of the cliff, the brood of a pair of grim ravens shrunk from our sight, and the gulls, one after another, began to wend their way overhead toward the middle of the quiet pool, as the furling of the sails was accompanied by the glad cries of the sailors. The remarkable land beacons erected in that country to guide vessels in the harbor looked like so many figures of gigantic stature formed from the large blocks that lay on every hill around. A low valley in which meandered a rivulet opened at a distance to the view. The remains of a deserted camp of seal catchers was easily traced from our deck, and as easily could we perceive the innate, the innate tendency of man to mischief in the charred and crumbling ruins of the dwarf pine forests. But the harbor was so safe and commodious that before we left it to find shelter in another, we had cause to be thankful for its friendly protection. We were accoutred for the occasion, as I have said, and instantly made for shore. Anxious to receive as much information as possible in a given time, we separated. The more active scaled the most difficult heights, and among them was our captain, Mr. Emery, than whom more, than whom more, an, a more expert seaman and a better man is rarely to be found. Others chose the next most difficult place of ascent while I and my young friend Dr. Shattuck of Boston slowly moved along in a quest of birds, plants, and other objects. We soon reached a considerable elevation, from which we beheld the broad Gulf of St. Lawrence gathering its gray vapors, as if about to cover itself with a mantle, while now and then our eye was suddenly attracted by the gliding movements of our distant parties as they slipped down the declivities. In this manner we had surveyed the country for several miles, when the sea fog began to approach the land so swiftly that, with the knowledge we had all acquired of the difficulty of proceeding overland when surprised by it, we judged it prudent to return to our vessel. 
There we compared notes and made preparations for the morrow. One fair morning, while several of us were scrambling through one of the thickets of trees, scarcely waist-high, my youngest son chanced to scare from her nest a female of the black pole warbler. Reader, just fancy how this raised my spirits. I felt as if the enormous expense of our voyage had been refunded. There, said I, we are the first white men who have seen such a nest. I peeped into it, saw that it contained four eggs, and observed its little owner looking upon us with anxiety and astonishment. It was placed about three feet from the ground, in the fork of a small branch, close to the main stem of a fir tree. Its diameter internally was two inches, the depth of one and a half. Externally, it resembled the nest of the white-crowned sparrow, being formed of green and white moss and lichens, intermixed with coarse, dried grass. Within this was a layer of bent grass, and the lining was of a very dark-colored dry moss, looking precisely like horsehair, arranged in a circular direction with great care. Lastly, there was a thick bed of large, soft feathers, some of which were from ducks, but most of them from the willow grouse. I must now return to the United States and trace the progress of our warbler. It enters Louisiana as early as the middle, Fe as the middle of February. At this time, it is seen gleaning food among the taller branches of the willows, maples, and other trees that overhang the rivers and lakes. Its migrations eastward follow the advance of the seasons, and I have not been able to comprehend why it is never seen in the maritime parts of South Carolina, while it is abundantly found in the state of New Jersey, close to the seashore. There, you would think that it had changed its habits, for instead of skipping among the taller branches of trees, it is seen moving along the trunks and large limbs, almost in the manner of a surthia, searching the chinks of the bark for larvae and pupae. They are met with in groups of ten, twelve, or more, in the end of April, but after that period few are to be seen. In Massachusetts, they begin to appear nearly a month later, the intervening time being, being no doubt spent on their passage through New York and Connecticut. I found them at the end of May in the eastern part of Maine, and met with them wherever we landed on our voyage to Labrador, where they arrived from the 1st to the 10th of June, throwing themselves into every valley covered by those thickets, which they prefer for their breeding places. It also breeds abundantly in Newfoundland. In these countries, it has almost become a flycatcher. You see it darting in all directions after insects, chasing them on the wing, and not unfrequently snapping so as to emit the clicking sound characteristic of the, characteristic of the true flycatcher. Its activity is pleasing, but its notes have no title to be called a song. They are shrill and resemble the noise made by striking two small pebbles together, more than any sound that I know. They may be in some degree imitated by pronouncing the syllable sitch, 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 so as to progressively increase the emphasis. I found the young fully grown in the latter part of August, but with the head as in the females, and like them they obtain their full plumage during the next spring migration, after which these birds return southward. They raise only one brood in the season, and if any of them breed in the United States, it must be in the northern parts. They are seldom seen in autumn in the States, and very seldom during the summer months. The black pole warbler is a gentle bird, by no means afraid of man, although it pursues some of its smaller enemies with considerable courage. The sight of a Canadian jay excites it greatly, as that marauder often sucks its eggs or swallows its young. In a few instances, I have seen the jay confounded by the temerity of its puny assailant. The occurrence of this species so far north in the breeding season, and the curious diversity of its habits in different parts of the vast extent of country in which it, tra which it traverses, are to me quite surprising, and lead me to add some remarks on the migration of, this various, speci of various species of sylvia, which, like the present, seem to skip, as it were, over large portions of the country. In the courses of my voyages to the south southeastern extremity of the peninsula of the Floridas, I frequently observed birds of many kinds flying either high or low over the sea. Of these, the greater number were, like the present species, sylvia, which are never found in Georgia or the two Carolinas. Their course was a direct one, and as such, led me to believe that the little voyagers were bound for Cape Hatteras. The meeting with many of the species to which I allude, along the shores of Maryland, New Jersey, the eastern coast of Long Island, etc., and all along the Bay of Fundy, have strengthened the idea. But as I may not be correct, 
I leave the matter to the determination of more experienced observers. The subject appears to me to be one of the greatest importance, for the occurrence of plants in, a certain par in certain parts of a country and not in others may possibly be caused by the absence during migration of such birds as move by, quote, shortcuts from one point of land to another. And then he goes on to describe the... Uh, I, I usually cut out of these when I read the... Uh, Specific descriptions like, oh, female with the upper parts, oil green, streaked with black, the rump and upper tail covered with plain and edged with gray. He usually goes on with a lengthy physical description. Uh, but usually those aren't quite as exciting. And plus, you have the, the beautiful paintings to have a look at. All right, I had one more specifically planned. And by planned, I mean I looked at looked at the website for like five minutes. I, you know, other than the Blue Jay, I haven't read these specific ones before, uh, which is why I stumble over my words sometimes. But I wanted to do the flamingo and something went oddly wrong on my slideshow Oop. there we go S slow that down uh oddly wrong on my slideshow so that unfortunately it uh does not uh, hold on pulling this up here show you the main image it whenever i loaded that in it messed up with my slideshow so what i'm going to do real quick is take you to their to their version of the image on their website so you can kind of see the whole thing real quick. All right, it's a wonderfully colorful painting, and I'm not sure. I, I have seen an Audubon original painting in a museum once in Tulsa, and I don't remember if it was this one or um, it might have been uh, the turkey, which is actually the, the bird he opens the book with. He doesn't... Uh, uh, he doesn't go alphabetically. All right, so on to the flamingo. Let's see what he has to say about this one. Never read it before. Oh, hey, Abraham. Nice to have you join us. We're learning about birds. And I should mention that, again, I don't know a lot about birds. I am literally learning things about birds as I read. Like, reading that entry on Blue Jays, I didn't know Blue Jays ate eggs of other birds, which is probably a basic fact what lots of birders know, but I'm I'm still learning. But this is what I appreciate is that, you know, it's entertaining and that causes me to learn, which is a little bit along the lines of how I think about things like cartographic design and, and a lot of visual design generally. Like if you make it interesting and attractive, people might be more willing to spend time with it and then accidentally learn something they weren't intending to, which is great. That's kind of what's happening here. Uh, plate 431, the American Flamingo. On the 7th of May... 1832, while sailing from Indian Key, one of the numerous islets that skirt the southeastern coast of the peninsula of Florida, I for the first time saw a flock of flamingos. It was on the afternoon of one of those sultry days in which, in that portion of the country, exhibit towards the evening the most glorious effulgence that can be conceived. The sun, now far advanced toward the horizon, still shone with full splendor. The ocean round glittered in its quiet beauty and the light fleecy clouds that here and there spotted the heavens seemed flakes of snow margined with gold. Our bark was propelled almost as if by magic, for scarcely was a ripple raised by her bows as we moved in silence. Far away to seaward we spied a flock of flamingos advancing in Indian line with, with well-spread wings, outstretched necks, and long legs directed backwards. Ah, reader, could you but know the, the emotions that then agitated my breast? I thought I had now reached the height of all my expectations, for my voyage to the Floridas was undertaken in a great measure for the purpose of studying these lovely birds in their own beautiful islands. I followed them with my eyes, watching, as it were, every beat of their wings, and as they were rapidly advancing toward us, Captain Day, who was aware of my anxiety to procure some, had every man stowed away out of sight, and our gunners in readiness. The pilot, Mr. Egan, proposed to offer the first taste of his, quote, groceries to the leader of the band. He was a first-rate shot and had already killed many flamingos. The birds were now, as I thought, within 150 yards, when suddenly, to our extreme disappointment, their chief veered away and was, of course, followed by the rest. Mr. Egan, however, assured us that they would fly round the quay and alight not far from us in less than ten minutes, which in fact they did although to me these minutes seemed almost as hours. Now they come, said the pilot. Keep low. This we did, but alas, the flamingos were all, as I suppose, 
very old and experienced birds, with the expectation of one, for on turning round, with the ex, with the exception of one, for on turning round the lower end of the quay, they spied our boat again, sailed away without flapping their wings, and lighted about four hundred yards from us, and upwards of one hundred from the shore, on a soap flat of vast extent where neither boat nor man could reach them. I, however, watched their motions until dusk, when we reluctantly left the spot and advanced toward Indian Key. Mr. Egan then told me that these birds habitually returned to their feeding grounds toward evening, that they fed during the greater, greater part of the night, and were much more nocturnal in their habits than any of the heron tribe. When I reached Key West, my first inquiries, addressed to Dr. Benjamin Strobel, had reference to the flamingos, and I felt gratified by learning that he had killed a good number of them, and that he would assist us in procuring some. As on that key they are fond of resorting to the shallow ponds formerly kept there as reservoirs of water for the purpose of making salt, we visited them at, at different times, but always without success, and although I saw a great number of them in the course of my stay in that country, I cannot even at this moment boast of having the satisfaction of having had the satisfaction of shooting even a single individual. A very few of these birds have been known to proceed eastward of the Floridas, beyond Charleston and South Carolina and some have even been procured there within eight or ten years back. None have ever been observed about the mouths of the Mississippi. And to my great surprise when I did not meet and to my great surprise I did not meet with any in the course of my voyage to the Texas, where indeed I was assured they had never been seen, at least as far as Galveston Island. The western coast of Florida, and in some portion that of Alabama, in the neighborhood of Pensacola, are the parts to which they mostly resort but they are said to be there always extremely shy, and can be procured only by waylaying them in the vicinity of their feeding grounds toward evening, when, on one occasion, Dr. Strobel shot several in the course of a few hours. Dr. Leitner also procured, procured some in the course of his botanical excursions along the western coast of the Floridas, where he, at last, where he was at last murdered by some party of Seminole Indians at the, last time of, at the time of our last disastrous war with them. Well, that took quite a, quite a turn. <laughs> See, I hadn't read this entry before, and you get quite a, quite a recounting. Uh, flamingos, as I am informed, are abundant on the island of Cuba, more especially on the southern side of some of its shores, and where many islets at some distance from the mainland afford them ample protection. In their flight, they resemble ibises, and they unusually move in lines, with the neck and legs fully extended, alternately flapping their wings for 20 or 30 yards and sailing over like a space, over a like space. Before lighting, they generally sail around the place for several minutes, when their glowing tints become more conspicuous. They very rarely alight on the shore itself, unless, as I am told, during the breeding season, but usually in the water and on shallow banks, whether of mud or of sand, from which, however, they often wade to the shores. Their walk is stately and slow, and their cautiousness extreme, so that it is very difficult to approach them, and their greater height and their great height enables them to see and watch the movements of their various enemies at a distance. When traveling over the water, they rarely fly at a great height, greater height than eight or ten feet. But when passing over the land, no matter how short the distance may be, they, as well as ibises and herons, advance at a considerable elevation. I remember well that on one occasion when near Key West, I saw one of them flying directly toward a small hammock of mangroves, to which I was near, and towards which I made, in full expectation of having a fine shot. When the bird came within a hundred and twenty yards, it rose obliquely, and when directly over my head was almost as far off. I fired, but with no other effect than of altering its course, and inducing it to rise higher still. It continued to fly at this elevation until nearly half a mile off. When it sailed downwards, and resumed its wonted low flight. Although my friends, Dr. John Bachman, Dr. Wilson, and William Condart Esquire of Charleston, have been at considerable trouble in, a, in endeavoring to procure accounts of the nidification of these birds and their habits during the breeding season, and although they, as well as myself, have made many inquiries by letter respecting them of persons residing in Cuba, all that has been transmitted to me has proved of little interest. I am not, however, the less obliged by the kind intentions of these individuals, one of whom, A. Mallory Esquire, thus writes to Captain Croft, Croft as follows, Matanzas, 
April 30th, April 20th, 1837. Captain Croft, dear sir, I have made inquiry of several of the fishermen and salt rakers who frequent the keys to the windward of this place in regards to the habit of the flamingo, and have obtained the following information, which will be, I found, pretty, which will be found, I believe, pretty correct. First, they build upon nearly all the keys to the windward, the nearest of which is called Coyocino Linias. Secondly, it builds upon the ground. Thirdly, the nest is in a regular mass of earth dug in the salt ponds, and entirely surrounded by water. It is scooped up from the immediate vicinity to the height of two or three feet, and is of course hollow at the top. There is no lining, nor anything but the bare earth. Fourthly, the number of eggs is almost always two. When there is one, there has been probably some accident. The time of incubation is not known. The egg is white and near the size of the goose's egg. On scraping the shell, it has a bluish tinge. Fifthly, the color of the young is nearly white, and it does not attain the full scarlet color until two years old. Sixth, sixthly, when the young first leave the nest, they take to water, and do not walk for about a fortnight, as their feet are almost as tender as jelly. I do not think it is easy to procure an entire nest, but I am promised some of the eggs, this being the time to procure them. Very truly, your obedient servant, A. Mallory. End quote. Another communication is as follows, quote, The flamingo is a kind of bird that lives in lagoons having a communication with the sea. This bird makes its nest on the shore of the same lagoon with the mud which it heaps up beyond the level of the water. Its eggs are about the size of that of a goose. It only lays two or three at a time, which are hatched about the end of May. The young, when they break the shell, have no feathers, only a kind of cottony down which covers them. They immediately betake themselves to the water to harden their feet. They take from two to three months before their feathers are long enough to enable them to fly. The first year, they are rose-colored, and in the second, they obtain their natural color, being all scarlet. Half their bill is black, and the points of the wings are all black. The eyes are entirely blue. Its flesh is savory, and its tongue is pure fat. It is easily tamed, and feeds on rice, maize meal, etc. Its body is about a yard high and the neck half as much. The breadth of the nest, with little difference, is that of the crown of a hat. The way in which the female covers the eggs is by standing in the water on one foot and supporting its body on the nest. The bird always rests in a lagoon, supporting itself on one leg alternately, and it is to be observed that it always stands with its front to the wind. End quote. An egg, presented to me by Dr. Bachman, and of which two were found in the nest, measures three inches and three-eighths in length, two inches and one-eighth in breadth, and is thus of an elongated form. The shell is thick, rather rough or granulated, and pure white externally, but of a bluish tint, when the surface is scraped off. End of entry. I One thing that struck me when reading this is just thinking about how, you know, um, you know Naturists operated very, uh, naturalists rather, operated very differently back then. Right? He's a naturalist today, you know, people working in conservation and studying birds and such would generally not be super eager to go out and shoot as many of them as possible. But not only was, you know, expectations different back then, but also it was that was how they could get specimens to actually make the paintings that you're looking at or to study them in depth because, you know, there wasn't photography, there was no way to really capture some of those details except by close inspection of a deceased bird. Uh, so just kind of an interesting observation that as I've as I've read through these things that I've noticed and also the sort of the old geographic terms the Floridas because in his time there were you know there was Spanish Florida and I think uh, depending on when he was doing his explorations because he did the, these explorations over decades you know there was then British Florida, which I think then got bought, bought by the United States. I don't quite remember, but the Floridas, the Texas, and these sorts of things. And Ibrahim's pointing out, imagine this impressive and detailed description would be one video and some photos nowadays. Yeah, probably. What I actually like to think, this reminds me, is that I feel like, I feel like uh, John James Audubon would be a popular... Uh, a popular bird blogger in this day and age. I can imagine a lot of people following along his adventures as he goes to find all the birds and what he happened to see with them and then followed up by a little, you know, technical description of the birds. 
I think it'd be pretty popular. And so, I uh, that those are the three I had prepared for today. Uh, that I had sort of gotten some images together, and uh, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna leave off. We you know we had 45 minutes, which was like half an hour of reading and 15 minutes of the random stuff. But I appreciate you taking a little break for me. As I say, I really like you know I like reading to people. Um, it's kind of relaxing to do, and this is kind of a uh, a favorite thing to read, partly because it's also, I can do this on the internet, because it's out of copyright. There are other things I like to read to people, like various stories by Ray Bradbury and such, but all that's still on copyright, so I can't give a quote-unquote public performance of it uh, until those kind of things go out of copyright in several decades. But this thing was published in the 1830s, I think was like when the last portions came out, so maybe 1840s. So it's definitely very safe. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll say goodbye to all of you. Thanks so much for joining me and listening to me. And maybe there'll be more of this at some point in the future if I get the urge to do a little bit of reading. But uh, in the meanwhile, I hope I brought a little bit of knowledge to you about birds and a little bit of entertainment and relaxation to your day and whatever you might have happened to have been working on in the background while this is going on. And uh, I'll catch you all for some cartography-related live streams. Uh, a little bit uh, later on when we talk about color and maybe some uh, 